Natalie Hendricks, Chloe Berg, Katie Lawler, Maddie Lawler. More people died in Auschwitz or Canal than the British and American losses during World War II combined. In just one hour, 24 people would have died in Auschwitz or Canal. This is stated by Calvin Bratman, the founder of Forget You Not, a Holocaust Remembrance Project in the, in the article Auschwitz, the concentration and extermination camp written in 2016. Everyone here has heard of the concentration. Everyone here has learned about the Holocaust during their sophomore year of high school in Social 10 and has heard of the concentration camp Auschwitz-Birkenau. Auschwitz-Birkenau was one of the most infamous concentration camps of World War II. First, we will discuss the arrival of prisoners at Auschwitz-Birkenau. Second, we will explain prisoners' daily lives. Third, we will examine the medical experiments Dr. Mengele performed on prisoners. And finally, we will talk about the liberation of the camp. To begin, we will, I, we will start telling you about the arrival of the prisoners. In 1940, started the construction of Auschwitz-Birkenau. Surrounding these, this camp are barriers such as barbed wire fences. Rudolf Haas was the commander at this camp. Vincent Chatel, author of Auschwitz-Birkenau History and Overview under the Forgotten Camps section in Jewish History Library on April 22, 2015, states that in these camps, it can hold up to 150,000 Jews at one time. This is the largest concentration camp in Europe at the time. In May of 1940, Jewish people who lived in the surrounding areas of the camp were evicted and separated into two groups, workers and prisoners. The first transportation of these prisoners were almost all Polish people. The SS administration was then created in June of 1940. In total, 300 Jewish people became forced laborers and the rest were killed. Upon arrival, there would be SS physicians to classify, to clap, to classify the incoming prisoners. Many of the women, children, ill, elderly did not, did not meet these classifications and would be sent straight to the gas chambers. Approximately 70 to 75 percent of those who entered Auschwitz were not exited alive. Wanda Hutney, founder of the Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum, states in the article Auschwitz-Birkenau, written in 2015, that the prisoners who were kept for labor were marked and tattooed for identification. Every prisoner was given a badge in order for classification, and those who were kept for slave labor were marked with tattoos of serial numbers. Some prisoners were marked with patches on their uniforms, according to race, sexuality, and criminal background. Now that we've informed you about how prisoners arrived, let's begin talking about prisoners' daily lives. In June of 1940, 20 brick buildings were built to be the sleeping quarters for prisoners. In this photo, you can see some of the original 20 buildings. Six of these buildings were meant to be two stories, and 14 of them were single stories. Eight, in June of 19, 1941, eight new buildings were built, and many of the single stories were renovated to be two stories. These buildings were called blocks due to their large size. Each block could hold up to 700 prisoners, but in reality, they held over 1,000. In the early stages of the camp, prisoners did not sleep on beds, but they slept on straw stuffed mattresses. In February of 1941, the first three level bunk bed was introduced. After this bunk bed was introduced, the camp started producing single and double bunks. In this photo, you can see the inside of one of the blocks with triple, double, and single story bunks. Another hardship that prisoners of Auschwitz-Birkenau had to deal with was their meals and nutrition. Each prisoner upon their arrival was given a bowl, like so. This bowl would be with them throughout their entire stay. If a prisoner was to forget his or her bowl upon, during mealtimes, they would not be fed. And if a prisoner lost his or her bowl, they would receive a severe punishment before getting it back. Gertie Skowski, an Auschwitz-Birkenau survivor, states in the documentary Roll Call, published in 2000, that each prisoner was given three meals a day. The first meal that they were given was a bowl of soup, or was a bowl of hot, hot tea or coffee. This coffee wasn't made from coffee beans, though. It was made from a grain broth-like substance. The second meal they would receive would be after their noon, noon roll call. This would be a soup containing potatoes and other root vegetables, groats, rye flour, and avo food extract. This soup wasn't meant, to be, wasn't meant to taste good, but was meant to be sustainable. Many new prisoners could actually not eat this because of its taste. The, sec the final meal of the day was 
was dinner. They were given a 300 grams of black bread and 20 to 30 grams of marmalade, cheese, or sausage. In this photo, you can see an accurate representation of what a day's worth of food at Alfred Birkmount would look like. Each prisoner was given 1,300 to 1,700 calories a day. Those who had more physically enduring jobs would receive closer to 1,700, and those with, thir and those with less enduring jobs would receive closer to 1,300. Food and nutrition slight got improved slightly in, the late 19 in late 1942. In June of 1942, camp administration allowed charities to send food parcels. Food parcels are packaged foods that charities would send around Europe during this time. Although Jewish and, Jewish and Soviet prisoners of war did not get this luxury. Life in the camp often included punishment and death. Punishments at Auschwitz-Birkenau were not given out equally. Some prisoners would be given different punishments for the same offense. Zenon Slavisinki, Holocaust theologist, states in the article Between Forgiveness and Unforgiveness, written in September of 2015, that slacking at work, going to the bathroom, illegal possession of food, clothing, and photographs, and being caught attempting suicide were all causes for punishment and execution. One form of punishment was flogging. Prisoners would be publicly beaten with a bull whip or stick. They would be forced to count out each blow in German, and if they lost count, would have to start all over. Another form of punishment was confinement, which took place in Blocky Lovin. One going through this punishment hoped for a regular cell because it had a small window and a wooden bunk to lie on. However, you could also be placed in a dark cell containing only air holes with no light or place to sleep. Prisoners in these cells were punished from several days to several weeks. Standing cells measured less than one square meter and had only a five by five inch square covered by a metal grate for airflow. Four prisoners would enter these cells through the small doors each night. They would come out only for work the next morning. This photo shows the knocked down walls of the standing cells to display the tight space. Prisoners could not even sit. They could be punished from several nights to several weeks in these cells. The post was an extremely painful punishment for prisoners' hands would be bound behind their backs and they would be hung from a post as shown in this photo. This lasted for hours at a time, and prisoners usually lost consciousness due to the pain. Oftentimes, it broke the prisoner's shoulder tendons, causing them to lose mobility of the arms and be gassed because they were unfit for work. Igor Bartosik, researcher for the 2015 documentary Auschwitz, writes in the article Auschwitz-Birkenau, the Penal Company, written in 2016, that the Penal Company was another form of punishment at Auschwitz-Birkenau. These prisoners were completely isolated and were forbidden to contact other prisoners or receive any letters. They performed the hardest of labor at double the speed and were beaten regularly. Prisoners could be in the penal company from one month to almost a year. Other punishments at Auschwitz-Birkenau included intense labor while being beaten and being denied food. For many, death at Auschwitz-Birkenau was inevitable. Some prisoners' deaths were predetermined, while others simply died of starvation. Some transfer prisoners were marked with return not desired, meaning this prisoner was to die after a certain amount of time at the camp. The camp commandant, director, and head of political department could also order executions. Oftentimes, prisoners just died from starvation, being overworked, or intense punishment. One form of execution was shooting where prisoners would be forced to strip and stand in front of the death wall. Executioners would walk behind them and shoot the backs of their heads. These designated prisoners were in charge of carrying the bodies onto trucks to be delivered to the crematoria. It is estimated that over 1,000 prisoners died in this way. Another method of execution was hanging, which took place publicly at evening roll call. Prisoners could also die from gassing. They would arrive at the camp and be told to undress because they were going to have a shower. They would then enter the gas chambers that can hold from 350 to 2,500 people and be gassed with Zyklon B, 
a gas meant for fumigation. This picture shows the fingernail scratches that victims left on the gas chamber walls. The last method of execution was locking prisoners in dark cells where they would die of starvation. Now that you know about the life of the prisoners, I will start by telling you about Joseph Mengele and what he did. In 1937, Joseph Mengele joined the Nazi party. He was then drafted into the army and thereafter volunteered into the medical services of Waffen SS. Joseph Mengele is commonly known as the Angel of Death or the White Angel. Joseph Mengele likes to experiment on many different kinds of people. The main people he likes to experiment on is twins. And this is the reason. He thought that they might have ge different genetic disorders or various diseases. According to the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, which has 55 council members appointed by the President of the United States, states in the article Joseph Mengele written in 2016 that Mengele had a fascination with heterochromia. Heterochromia is a condition in which two irises differ in color on one person. Throughout Joseph Mengele's days at Auschwitz, he started collecting the eyes of his patients. Joseph Mengele tried finding the breaking point of the human body by performing major surgeries without using any anesthetic or without or trying to conjoin twins by sewing them together. Joseph Mengele would Joseph Mengele would put water on patients that was extremely hot or extremely cold to find the various pharmaceutical preparations for these patients to see the most effective way for treating frozen or chilled patients he would put his patients in a tank of water that was below freezing and make them sit up in the water for up to three hours most people died in this experiment for the survivors rewarming was attempted during in another experiment he would put his patients outdoor and make them undress and make them sit outside for various hours. Most people died in this experiment also. To study the various methods of making seawater drinkable, he would starve the patient, patients for many, many weeks on end and only give them chemically processed seawater. This would cause great pain and severe injury. To investigate the most effective treatment for mustard gas wounds, he would infect the victims with their with mustard gas, and most people died also in this experiment. After the war, Mengele found himself in U.S. custody, with the U.S. not knowing that he was that he was a wanted suspect, they let him go. According to the Holocaust Education and Archive Research team, written by Eric Nurberger, professor of European and Jewish history, states in the article Joseph Mengele, Angel of Death, written in 2007, that Soon after, Mengele suffered a stroke and, and died and drowned. Although Mengele's experiments were not humane, they benefited us in the long run for, for knowing the, the breaking point on the human body. Now that you know about the main doctor at Auschwitz, Dr. Mengele, I will now discuss the liberation of the camp. Auschwitz-Birkenau eventually became liberated during World War II. The Red Army had been advancing deeper into Poland since mid-January of 1945. They liberated Warsaw and Krakow and headed for Auschwitz. When the German Nazis heard about these liberations, they went on a murder spree. They shot sick prisoners and blew up dead bodies in an attempt to destroy their evidence. They then sent prisoners on death marches. Around 60,000 inmates were sent. The first to leave on these death marches were those from the industrial regions of Auschwitz. These were forced laborers who lived in much better living conditions than the, camp, than the camp prisoners. They were not too weak or too sick to begin their death march home. The prisoners were then sent. They were forced to walk long distances in the bitter cold with little or no food, water, or rest. They were then forced to walk to the city of Władysław, a town 35 miles away where they were put on freight trains to other camps. Some prisoners were shot if they could not keep up on these death marches. Others died of exhaustion, starvation, and from being out in the cold for too long. About one in four of these prisoners died along the way. According to Victoria Nesfield, 
a research administrator in the history department at the University of York, she stated in the article titled The Liberation of Auschwitz, written in 2016, that more than 15,000 people died on these death marches. The Soviet Allied troops then came into Auschwitz and liberated the camp. According to Anita Kondoindi, who has her master's degree in East European Studies from Georgetown University and is the author of the academic journal titled The Liberating Experience, War Correspondents, Red Army Soldiers, and Nazi Extermination Camps, written in 2010, that Auschwitz was liberated on January 27, 1945 at three o'clock in the afternoon. They found six storehouses with hundreds of thousands of women's dresses, men's suits, shoes, and jewelry, jewelry such as rings that the Germans did not have time to burn. They also found large amounts of Zyklon B and gas masks. About a week later in the beginning of February, they moved sick prisoners from Birkenau to Auschwitz hospitals. Soviet aides and Polish volunteers from the surrounding areas helped, helped transport these people via horse and wagon. They carried seriously ill people on stretchers. It took about two weeks to move everybody. As you can see, the liberation of Auschwitz only saved a small percentage of the millions of people that were brought to this camp. In conclusion, Auschwitz-Birkenau was one of the most infamous camps during World War II. First, we discussed the arrival of the prisoners. Second, we told you about the daily life of camp prisoners. Third, we examined the medical experiments performed by Dr. Mengele. And finally, we discussed the liberation of the camp. In just one hour, 24 people would die at Auschwitz Birkenau. In the time it took to give this speech, all four of us would have died at Auschwitz Birkenau. 1640.